All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you to the organizers for uh, having me here today. I want to talk to you today uh, about three topics. Uh, creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship. We hear a lot about these three different terms, and I want to give you my thoughts, my definitions, and a little bit about what we can do uh, in these three different areas. When we think about creativity, we think about creativity, sometimes also hear it called ideation. When we think about innovation, we think about coming up with something new. Well, that's also creativity. We think about entrepreneurship, we think about acting on an innovation. And so, to me, I've tried to display that pictorially here, where we start off with creativity, and then we move to innovation, and then to entrepreneurship. And the, way I, and the reason I've represented it this way is because, to me, creativity is an essential part of innovation. Innovation is an essential part of entrepreneurship. And so that's why I represent it in these three circles like this here. So what is creativity? Sometimes you'll hear ideation, creativity, a whole bunch of different terms. But it's essentially coming up with a new idea. It can be a new design. It can be a new artifact. It can be a new uh, piece of, uh, of, of art. Right? It can be several different things. But it does not have to address a need. So if you look at the US Patent Trade Office, you'll see a whole bunch of different patents there, some of which people have capitalized on. They found them to be innovative. They've taken that novelty, and they've made something out of it. And a lot of them are just there, and they've gone no further. Now, by definition, a patent has to be novel. So all these patents are novel, but not all of them have been acted on. Not all of them have been reduced to practice. Well, in theory, they need to be able to show that they're reduced to practice, but are they actually reduced to practice and address a need? How can you be creative? There's a lot of different ways to, to think about generating ideas, being creative, and creativity. When I was an undergraduate engineering student, the way to generate new ideas was brainstorming. A colleague of mine, Jonathan Weaver from the University of Detroit uh, Mercy, says brainstorming is dead. I tell my students brainstorming is dead. Well, I don't believe it's truly dead, but there are so many different ways for us to generate ideas today that brainstorming is just one little tool in our toolkit. So what is brainstorming? Well, in my day, brainstorming was you'd go off to a little corner, maybe you'd have a group of you, and you'd think really hard. And, you know, I always thought of that uh, sculpture, you know, with the guy thinking. thinking. That was brainstorming, right? Um, were there rules? You could set up some rules if you wanted to. But you were just brainstorming. You were supposed to know what that meant, and ideas magically popped into your brain. Turns out that there are some different tools and techniques that we can think about to be creative, to come up with new ideas. One of the things I like to do, I tell my students all the time, is to uh, use existing information. There's a whole bunch of things already out there. I'm a visual learner, so I like to visualize things. I like to um, look at the literature, things like that there. Um, I like to take things apart. So for example, we take a look at this nice stool. And see it has four legs to support whoever's standing there. So it's really neat wire here. I wonder, what is that wire for? And so what if I was to take that apart and take that thing, you know, take that thing off? What happens? Can I figure out how to put this thing together myself? Can I reverse engineer it and take it apart? And then while I'm taking it apart, or maybe while I'm putting it back together, I can improve upon that. And so that's one way to be creative. Take it apart, look at how it works, look at how it functions, and then improve upon that. I like to surf the web. I like to look at trade magazines. I look at, like to look at uh, the big book, um, which is a literally big book with a bunch of different parts and machines and things. And I like to think about how do other areas use these technologies? Things that are simple like moving something from one point to another. I'm in biomedical engineering. I deal with biological things and medical devices and stuff like that there. 
but I can think about a construction site. And what if we needed to move a big pile of dirt from one point to the next? And we think about the backhoe. We think about how does that work? How does that arm work? Is there something I can use like that in my medical device? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But that's one way of looking at how other areas are accomplishing similar tasks. Um, think about how nature does it. The classic example is Velcro. Man was walking in the Alps one day, noticed the burrs from the, uh, um, from the plants were sticking on his dog. They were easy to pull off, but they stuck there pretty well. Took a closer look at that and found that hoop and look, uh, loop structure that was holding those things in. So, gee, this is kind of neat. I wonder if we can use this. And came up with Velcro. We think about using collaborative methods. And this is something we talk a lot about in our, in our classes. There's a bunch of different collaborative me methods. I get a couple of them up here. We can think about um, a rotating design idea. So for example, you know, a water bottle. It's a nice water bottle. It's different than the water bottles that we had five years ago. It's made of less material. I can tell it's a little flimsier. Right. It's got a cap on it. Well, maybe we were to take this water bottle and pass it around. And when it came to me, I would say, what's one improvement I can make to this water bottle? Hmm. Well, this cap is pretty high. Do we need it that high? And if you look at some of the new water bottles, you'll see that the cap size is actually reduced. Reduces plastic. Great idea. I pass it along to my, my, my colleague. Maybe they say, you know what? Let's make, let's make it out of a different material so that instead of having this flimsy paper on there, we can just put that stuff right on there nice and hard. We don't have to worry about people taking it off. All right? So you keep on passing it around and everybody adds a new idea, a new thought to that. And at the end you say, wow, this is great. What, what do we like? What do we not like? What attributes do we want to keep? The other, another method for collaboration is what we call the gallery method, where you put your idea up on a wall and you have your colleagues come by and evaluate that and put little sticky notes up there. What do they like? What do they not like about it? How might they improve that? Mm -hmm. And so these are different methods to, to work together. And in today's society, in science and engineering, it's really a group effort. And it's important to work together as a group. But the most important message I can tell you when it comes to creativity is use the method that works best for you. Maybe it is brainstorming. Right? Maybe it's a collaborative method. Maybe it's looking at other uh, technologies that are out there. But whatever works best for you, use that. Innovation. Well, to me, creativity is the first step of innovation. But to be innovative, something has to address a need. It could be a consumer need. It could be a society's need. But that is, to me, that's what makes creativity different from innovation. There actually has to, it has to fulfill a need. It must be doable. You've got to take this and do something. You can't just think about it, but it actually has to be able to make it, all right, to put it into action. And it generally, it's going to add value to your idea. And so we talk about value added. That's what innovation is to me. How can we be innovative? Well, the first step is understanding what the real problem is. In engineering design, this is always our first step. What is that problem that we're trying to solve here? Right. Let's make sure we fully understand that problem, and then we can attack the problem. Innovation, it's the same thing. Right. What must your design do? What gaps are there in the existing technology? And then how are you going to address those? How are you going to fix them? Opportunity recognition is another a uh, tool that you can use when you're innovating. Where are the opportunities? Just yesterday, I was at the International Society of Applied Cardiovascular, a meeting in, uh, in, in Cleveland, and there was a gentleman up there talking about changes that are coming to the healthcare laws. One of the changes that's coming in the healthcare law is a hospital is gonna get penalized. They're gonna get a fine, essentially, and have to pay more money for patients that get readmitted. What does that mean? Well, let me give you an example. If a patient has a pacemaker implanted into their body that tells their heart when to contract, gives it a little electrical signal telling it to contract. If something goes wrong with that pacemaker or with the implantation process, and maybe it's uh, an infection or maybe it's the, the electrodes are implanted in the wrong area or something happens and that patient needs to go back to the hospital within a, a, a few days, that's considered a readmission. 
And now the hospitals are going to get fined for that. And they're going to have to pay Medicare some money back. That's bad for the hospital. They don't like that. Well, this gentleman that gave the, the, the nice talk looked at this as an opportunity. Can we identify what is causing hospital readmission in the pacemaker industry, for example? And then can we fix that? And so that our design will overcome that. And there's an opportunity. And so while the hospitals are going, oh, we're going to have to give up all this money, here's this guy thinking, ah, here's an opportunity. So when you're innovative, when you're thinking, think about where those opportunities are. Right? Where is the pain in the environment? I started a company recently, and I go and give a lot of talks and a lot of pitches. And the question I keep getting is, what pain are you solving? Right? That's a question people want to know. Right? What are you fixing? So I think about my students in the, in, in the research lab. What activities are they doing over and over again that they don't like to do? Is there some way that we can fix that? There's an opportunity there. Right. One of the important things to do when you're innovating is put yourself in the consumer or the end user's shoes. Right. What is it that they're looking for? What is it that they need? Right. That's going to help you be more innovative. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about entrepreneurship. To me, entrepreneurship is acting on innovation. We can come up with something that's innovative, it's novel, it's useful, but that's it. That's where entrepreneurship to me takes over. Let's take that and actually deliver it to the people who need this. Right. So whether it's a new cardiac pacemaker, we can design these prototypes, and we do that here. We do it an awful lot in our classes. We come up with some really innovative designs, some innovative stuff. But to take that next step and actually deliver it, that's where the entrepreneurship comes in. We have to deliver on the innovation to address the need. Now, these can include commercial entities. And generally, when you think about entrepreneurship, you think, oh, somebody's trying to make money. But that's not necessarily true. Right. People are also doing social entrepreneurship. And people are coming up with different ways to address needs of developing countries. They're not looking to make a dollar. They're looking to just address a society need. So you can be entrepreneurial and not worry about making a dollar. So how to be entrepreneurial? Think about the goals of your organization. If your organization is out to make a profit, and remember most for-profit companies, that's what they're there for, think about that goal. If your goal is to address a society's need in a developing country, that's the goal of your organization. Leverage your strengths. We each have our own strengths. We each have weaknesses. We need to leverage our strengths, and then we need to Bring in other people to address the weaknesses that we have in, as an organization or as an individual. And to me, that's very important. Consider the smaller opportunities while you're working on the big hit. And so we recently formed a company, and we started out, we were going to deliver stem cells to the heart. And that was our focus. That's what my research is on. That's what I'm really excited about. Well, the company has since pivoted a couple of times, and we're no longer, that's no longer our, our big hit. That's our, well, that's still our big hit, but we're starting much smaller than that now because we want to realize that we can take a small step and still keep the company afloat. And actually, there's a lot, a lot of uh, uh, opportunities in these smaller steps. So consider working on um, some of those smaller opportunities while you're waiting for that big hit. What's the take-home message? Well, take-home message is the big circle. I think creativity starts it. It goes to innovation. Creativity is an essential part of innovation. Innovation is an essential part of successful entrepreneurship. Be yourself. Use the techniques that work best for you, especially when it comes to creativity. You have a lot of different tools, a lot of techniques out there. It's more than just brainstorming. Use what works best for you. Start small while aiming big. You don't always have to go for that big hit. Generally, those big hits take a long time to get there. See if there are smaller increments. And take a chance. Thank you.